course, is to know and to share. And we'll talk about that, of course, in relationship to our faith. And again, just like this morning session, I'll ask some questions and like to make it as interactive as, as we can. Um, and after this, of course, we have some more sharing uh, questions before, uh, before Mass. And, and if we, I'd like to, if we have time at the end of this one, which I think we will, I'd like to have a group reporting kind of from each of your groups if we can as well. So, to know and to share. So, we'll begin with the prayer. This prayer, there's two uh, slides for it. So, if you can see it, you can read along with it. If not, you can just uh, follow along in your hearts. So we'll begin in the sign of our faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray to thee, I wish to believe in thee. Lord, let my faith be full and understand, and let it penetrate my thoughts, my way of judging divine things and human things. Lord, let my faith be joyful and give peace and gladness to my spirit, and expose it for of what something is or someone 
and understanding who that person is. So much of our knowing is related to our relationship, of course, with Christ. It's all those other things you mentioned as well, of course, we want to understand. This should look a little bit familiar, a little different slide, but the words are very similar. They're actually the same words. I stole it from Sister Mary's slides, actually. Um, and it, it is this idea to know with these three areas, right? Head, heart, and hands. Doctrine, worship, and morals. And who are we knowing? The person that is identified in the scriptures for us as the truth, the life, and the way. Jesus Christ. And uh, I know uh, Sister Corey, I think, mentioned in our sharing earlier that this is like, like our ESA in Perseo, right? It's very much related to that. Piety, study, and action that is dedicated toward knowing Christ. I'm going to explain that in a minute, but um, you know, sometimes when we learn about our faith, you know, we sometimes we're actually pretty good about studying these books, right, and learning the details. So uh, you're not sure, but sometimes we are, right? And we and, and like Corsio, we learn all about the details of Corsio and what the what it says in the Rolio and how to present it. But I suggest to you that when we're knowing our faith. We want to know it at a little bit different level, a much deeper level. Yes, we have to know the facts in, in the church itself. We need to know and understand what the church teaches. We need to know what the church teaches about sin. We need to know what the church teaches about love, about all kinds of things, right? We need to know the creed. Most of us have the creed memorized. We said that earlier. We need to know that Christ came and saved us from our sins. But there's a much deeper level of knowing and understanding kind of God's plan for us and for the church. And the reason I put this here is I think sometimes we know God's plan and we understand it, but we really don't enter into it as deeply as, as, as we can. And in fact, getting, I'm going to get ahead of myself for a minute, but before we talk about sharing, you know, sometimes we're like afraid to share our faith with other people like Protestants because we say, oh, they know all this stuff about the Bible and things. You ever have that expression and feeling? Nonsense. They may know a lot about the Bible, but many of them don't even understand the basics of what the Bible is, the basics of what our faith is. And I'm not saying that to put down Protestants, but I'm saying that because we have to be so aware of the richness of our faith and how it came to us that we live it and that we shouldn't be afraid to share that with anybody. And so that's why I put this, this little diagram up, and I'll explain that. You know, you're familiar with the word New Testament, and we often hear the word New Testament and Old Testament. Most people really don't know what that word actually means or where it comes from. When we hear New Testament and Old Testament, we think, or you hear the word testament, what immediately comes to mind is what? The Bible. The Bible. The word testament really originally didn't have anything to do with the Bible at all, one way or the other. It wasn't used in that way when we think of our faith. Jesus is one of the first persons that we hear in the scriptures that actually use the word testament, although you don't see it in the scriptures as testament. We see it in the scriptures as the word covenant, because the word that is translated testament in the Greek is the same word that's translated covenant. And the only place you'll see it in the Bible is to say covenant. And do we know what a covenant is? Anybody want to give me a definition of a covenant? Uh, raise your hand, so whoever wants to, no, um, whoever raises their hand gets to Commandment. Raise your hand. Okay, other notes. It's a commandment. A commandment? The covenant? Well, there is a commandment, I mean, it, it's associated with that, certainly the law is, in the Old Testament, was, I'm using it the wrong way too, but it, the law was uh, part of the covenant. Uh, how about since we I think it's a binding contract. A binding contract. Okay. And, and, okay. What? In agreement. An agreement. An agreement or a binding contract. Yes. It's much more important than a contract. Yes. Brother Brother Beth. Contract by God to mankind. Contract by God to mankind. Those promise? Okay, yeah, all those things are, are very good and they all go into what a covenant is and excuse me. Mm -hmm. That pretty much summarizes it. It is, it is this agreement, and in fact, it's an unbreakable agreement. And uh, I often share this when I give the uh, marriage uh, talk, the part of the sacrament, Rolio on marriage. 
when talking about it in the context of marriage, because the covenant is a, is a marriage relationship as well. Well, the covenant with God is a marriage relationship of God with his people. And it is an unbreakable agreement toward relationships. So it is a, a contract, if you will, but it's not, but it's actually not. It's more than that, because contracts can be broken. A covenant cannot be broken, at least on God's part. We sometimes mess it up pretty bad. But God's never gonna, never gonna break that. And so when we hear this word testament that really came about as covenant, even though we use it for the New Testament, the Old Testament scriptures, that's okay. But those things came about later on. That is the word Jesus introduced. When Jesus came, and we hear this in the words, take this is the cup of the new covenant. That new covenant is Jesus coming to us as human person, fully divine, fully human, offering his life as a ransom for us on the cross. And how did he communicate that to us? He didn't do it through a written book. He did it through those words. This is the blood of the new covenant. Jesus Christ gave us the church, gave us the liturgy. The, the books came later. Jesus transmitted to us this great message, this great agreement, this binding covenant with us to love us forever and bring us to heaven to live with him forever by offering his body and blood on the, Christ, on the cross and then calling us to do it, to remember that in the liturgy of the Eucharist. So the church, from the very, very beginning, is the Mass, is the Eucharist. And so Jesus gave the Testament or the New Covenant, which is Christ revealed to us through the liturgy. And the consequence of that, if you will, is Christ lived in the church. So the New Covenant is the liturgy in the church. The New Testament is the liturgy in the church. Now that's not saying that those scriptures are not important. Those scriptures came to us also through the writings of the apostles who Jesus put in charge of his church. And so those are the inspired word of God, but they came to us in support of this tradition or in conjunction with this tradition that was given through the liturgy. And just a, a little bit of trivia, one of the primary criteria for, for writings to be considered for the New Testament, what we call the New Testament, is that they were used in the liturgy. Almost everything that is in the New Testament were letters that were written during, the, written, excuse me, were uh, read during the Eucharistic ministry, uh, Eucharistic liturgy, excuse me, in the first century or in the very early church. And so if we understand this way that the church came about and how we've been called into this beautiful church, we should have great joy in sharing that news with others and we you know, don't need to be afraid of anyone. Now we shouldn't be beating them over the head with the liturgy any more than they should beat us over the head with the, with the scriptures, right? But it's just that if we can really understand that and start to live that, people will see it in us. They'll, they will be attracted to that. And I'm not saying that our job is to go out and convert all the Protestants to Catholicism. Um, that's a long-term goal, but that's not our short-term goal. Um, it is our long-term goal. I mean, it, you know, Christ said that there will be one church one day. But, but that's not what we're supposed to be focused on. But we do need to focus on really having the joy and living this uh, message that Christ gave us. Now, and... Again, talked about knowing as being this deeper kind of knowing. Yes, we have to learn the catechism. Yes, we have to do these things. So I've, I've come here, to, it's just kind of a summary of what I call an environment for knowing. So this is the kind of thing that we need to have before we can know. I mean, I could be really smart, and I'm not saying I am, I said I could be really smart, and I could read the catechism, and I could understand it from an academic standpoint, and think even it's very well written, which it is, and, and study the history that went into it on all those things, and I wouldn't know any of them. I, I could, and, and believe me, there are plenty of people in the church like that, and we have to be careful to perhaps not become those kind of people. 
I have to have this kind of environment and I have to cultivate this environment. And what do we learn environment is from, from the Corsillo? This is maybe a little trick question for some of you. What is environment? The first environment, I should say, because well, there are multiple environments. But what's the first environment that we evangelize? Ourselves. Ourselves, the human person, our human person. So we need to cultivate in our environment, our first environment, humility, obedience, and submission. And submission. I'm not specifically talking to your husband or your wife. <laughs> that's, that's actually a little bit related, but not, not so much. I'm, what I'm really talking about here is a humility and an obedience to Christ, which we're all ready and willing, right, to be obedient to Christ. But are we ready to be obedient to the body of Christ on earth, the church that Christ has put in charge? of this covenant because that's what it says is we need to first off approach the study of of the of that we do in the catechism and the other documents of the church and that we're going to be willing to be obedient to them even when we may read something that we don't like and when we read something we don't understand that's okay but we have to ask god to try it and, and and teach us and then we have to have submission and of course that submission at a couple levels submission to the will of christ specifically in our lives so if Christ is really calling you to be out on the march for life, which I know he is me, he may not be all of you, I go every year. When Christ calls you to go out and feed the poor and perhaps risk some your own life, and I'm not saying he's calling everybody to do that, but he does call some people to do that. You know, sometimes we're so worried about getting into a place of danger, but some of us are called to do that. The people that ran into the World Trade Center were called to go in and save people, and many of them lost their lives. Okay. But we have to be prepared for those kinds of callings that God might call us to. And some, most of us are probably going to be a little simpler callings. Oops, I disobeyed the rules. <laughs> So getting back to this, yes, we have to cultivate that and be submissive to the, to the will of God, but then, of course, also submissive to the teachings of the church. And, you know, when the church says you go to Mass every Sunday, you go to Mass every Sunday, you may not understand exactly why. I hope most of us in here do this. Um, we do it. Okay, actions for knowing. Study the catechism, as we've been saying all day. And, and there are other teachings and documents of the church, as Sister Mary was suggesting, Vatican II documents. Um, pray. Prayer is always essential to everything we do, right? Frequent the sacraments, especially Eucharist and confession. There's so many Catholics, and I, I have to admit it, myself included, who do not go to the sacrament of confession as often as we should. If you listen to most pastoral counselors and spiritual directors, they will self tell you that probably the minimum you should be going to confession is once a month. That's kind of a minimum, okay? A month? You should really be going once a month. The church doesn't say you have to go once a month. The, the law of the church says you have to go once a year. Okay. But honestly, if we're serious about our faith, once a month is probably about, about minimum. I mean, you're okay if you go... I shouldn't say that. You may be okay if you go once a month. Obviously, if you commit a mortal sin, you should go as soon as you possibly can. But once a month is probably a reasonable suggestion for all of us in this, in, in this room. You know, probably not any more often than that. It's not necessary. That's, I, sh I better stop. I'll be saying the wrong things because that's really a personal thing as to, to how often we go. But at least once a month, I would suggest it. Okay, let's talk about, in relation to faith, what does it mean to share? Probably hit on some of those things, but anybody want to volunteer to answer that? And if you can raise your hand, it makes it a little easier. Can you raise your hand? Who said that? Mr. Barra? To be open. To be open, okay. To live it. To live it, yeah, okay, very good. Anybody else? Yes. 
To give. Ah, ah, very good, yeah. All of the answers so far are very much part of it, but yeah, to give. Yes. Contribute. Contribute, okay, yes. Yes. To be generous, yes. All right. All good things. I think those are all, all accurate, certainly. Sort of what does it mean to share? I'll read it. I don't know if you can read it. I was just fine with the concept of sharing my faith until the pastor said we actually had to talk to people. <laughs> just a cute little joke here. We're going to continue talking about sharing, and I have a, a, a talk about some of the things you just mentioned in a moment. But this is another uh, small section from uh, uh, Pope Benedict, the 16th Samaritus. Um, motu proprio on the, that initiated the year of faith. It says, to rediscover the content of the faith that is professed, celebrated, lived, and prayed, and to reflect on the act of faith is a task that every believer must make his own, especially in the course of this year. Of course, he's referring to the year of faith. And what, our, what Pope Benedict is calling us to, and we're not on the hook because he's no longer Pope, because Pope Francis, of course, supports this year of faith and the whole concept, is that all of us are called to this kind of way to rediscover the content of the faith that is professed, okay, in the creed. You know, that's why today, how many acts, we read the act of faith, we read the creed, we read this other prayer for faith, uh, celebrated, lived, and prayed and to reflect on the act of faith is to take that every belief, I'm sorry, the task that every believer must make his own. So we have to really be doing all those things. And of course the celebrating is primarily in the Eucharist and in the other sacraments of the church. So the idea here really is that we can't share what we don't have, right? So you've probably heard that before. So we really have to focus and what the Pope is calling us most to do is focus on knowing Christ ourselves during this year so that we can rekindle our own faith. And when we do that, we're naturally going to want to share it. We have to also push ourselves a little bit on that sharing sometimes, like the cartoon said, you know, I'm afraid to talk to those people. And you know the people you need to talk to, though, isn't your brother and sister, of course, at least it, but it's the person sitting next to you in the office, right, who doesn't understand what's wrong with contraception and what's wrong with gay marriage, and even more importantly, they don't understand what's right with the church and what's right with the teaching of the church, which we'll get to that in a moment. So, similar to the other slide I had about having an environment and actions for knowing, this is an environment for sharing. Now, as we said, or as I said, I think well, Sister Mary said kind of the same thing, is that this is all integrated you know, our life, we can't just separate these things, so the sharing and the knowing come together, but just to focus, I, I come, came up with these things, the environment for sharing, which comes out of our knowing, really, is an environment of gratitude, joy, and compassion. You know, it doesn't do any good to share with somebody because we want to win an argument. That's useless, ineffective, and won't work anyway. So, we want to share because we have compassion for that person. I know it just, it just, frankly, sometimes I want to listen to the news or hear what commentators are saying or politicians are saying. Sometimes I just want to cry because I just feel how harmful that is to themselves, to their souls, and to the souls of other people, you know? And sometimes, of course, we don't know what to say in that situation. But we have to have that compassion and realize that, you know, the people who are out there, you know, doing the thing, secular things in the world that we know are so harmful, they're killing themselves spiritually and emotionally, and in many cases, even physically. Okay, actions for sharing. I think the first one is the one that we often forget, to listen. You're not gonna be able to share with somebody else unless you listen, you know their story, you begin to understand where they're coming from, what their need is. I mean, we can't just go in like a bowl and say, I'm Catholic. You know, we gotta go in and say, you know, Listen to their story. You know, what's your situation? Yes, that divorce must have been very painful. Yes, you know, I know what it must be like to have a child that's you know, off doing the wrong things. We have to listen to people. And then, of course, we have to love. You cannot share the gospel with anyone you do not love. 
it cannot be done. That doesn't mean that we're madly in love with the person, but we have to pull in the depths of our heart that love for humanity and that love for that individual that Christ has for us before we share. Kindness. We have to share with real kindness. And we have to proclaim the truth as good news. This is getting at what I was referring to earlier about this idea of we can't go beat people over the head. But we have to share the truth. But it's not so much that, oh, abortion is wrong because it's mortal sin. No, it's that, you know, we have another approach. We have an approach that leads to a fulfilling life. If you look at what Christ has taught us, you look at what the church has taught us about the beauty of the marriage, the beauty of the sexual relationship within the context of marriage, the beauty of the church teachings on a God who came and became wet to his church. That's how we have to proclaim the good news. Because everybody already has this idea outside the church, and unfortunately too many of us inside the church, that the church is about saying, no, you can't do this because it's wrong. Why? Because they want power. No, that's not it. The church isn't saying what's wrong. The church is saying right. So you really have to start getting into the practice of telling people what's right. And I wish I had uh, very specific words for that because I struggle with it as probably as much as you do. You know, trying to share that good news and trying to figure it out. But the first thing we have to do again is to really know, to really understand the teachings of the church. I think that was it. Yeah. So, questions about sharing and knowing or anything related? Anything really related to anything we've covered so far today? No? Everybody's ready for their nap. <laughs> Well, if not, I have some questions for sharing, and we'll pass those out. Uh, maybe if I could get somebody to... As they're being passed out, I'll read the two questions that we have here for you to share on. What does it mean... What does it mean... Oops, I should say for... Oh, okay. To you to know your faith. What does it mean to you to know your faith? And the second one, what is your experience of sharing your faith? And the sub-questions to that is, has it brought you joy? Has it brought you frustration? So you may want to, it may be more fun to focus on the second question than the first one, but it's up to you and your groups what you want to talk about, but these will maybe help you. So however you want to share, if it's too hot outside, you can stay here or whatever you want to do. Um, See. Mass is at three, is that right? It's at three. So we can take probably 20 minutes. So let's be back about 20, 20 to three. How's that? And then because then we're going to have some group reporting and get ready for mass. So. Is that right? 20 minutes would be 20 to three, right? It's 20 after right now. Okay. All right, so 20 minutes. Thank you.